said, you begin my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I can do it by myself. But if we, two or three, or the entire sanctuary could magnify the Lord together. If we can magnify the Lord together. Let us exalt his name together.
testify and say thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us today, God. God, you blessed us beyond measure. You have been good to us, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to operate in the gift of prophecy today and tell you it's your season to be blessed. Because troubles don't last always. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. So it's your season. It's your season. It's a season for blessings. It's a season for God to pour out upon his people. Oh!
Ghost in this house today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I wanted to get our song sheets out this morning and the song said, by and by. You may understand everything you're going through today. It's not, it's not God's job to explain every U-turn he wants to make in your life. But I promise you one thing for sure, that you will understand it better by and by. You will understand it more when you get on the other side of your hardship than you do right now. By and by when the morning comes. Now there's two reasons that we sing this song. Number one, because some of us need the victory. And number two, some of us have the victory. So whether you need it or whether you've got it, this song is for you today. And I promise you that if you'll march, the walls have got no choice but to come tumbling down in your life. And then it goes like this. By and by when the morning comes. When all
Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you glory this morning, dear God. We give you honor today, Lord Jesus. God, because your name is great and great to be praised, Almighty God. The heaven is thy throne, the earth is thy footstool. We bless you.
Give it unto you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank him for what he has done for you in your life right now. Think about that one more. What had God not have intervened? Had God not have intervened? Had the Lord not shown up when he did, you would not be here today. That's why I give you glory, Jesus. That's why I give you honor, dear God. We praise you, mighty God. For had it not been for you who was on our side, where would we be, Lord Jesus? God, we worship you and we anoint you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give the Lord blessings for making our way to our places this morning. We want to let you be seated in the wonderful name of Jesus. What a wonderful time we're having here in the house of the Lord today. And we want to this morning say welcome to so many distinguished guests who are with us on this wonderful Sunday morning, July, uh, I'm sorry, June the 26th of 2022. And people here who have come in early for our conference beginning this week, Revolution begins Wednesday through Sunday. And we're thankful for those of you that have made your way in from so very far distance to be with us on this Sunday morning. Good to see Sister Terry and her children here all the way from California this morning and with us. And the sister back here from Indiana with us this morning. And then another family in here from Oklahoma. Many people already in Baton Rouge for our wonderful meeting starting this Wednesday night. And then we're going to have a wonderful time all of this week. But before we get there, we're going to have a time in the Lord this morning. We're not promised anything except for this day. And I promise the Lord that I'm not going to hold back or put off till tomorrow what must be done today. And the Lord is deserving of glory this very day. Why don't you just lift your hands toward heaven and worship Him with us this morning. Worship Him. The book of 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, in verse number 1, St. Paul wrote and said, I knew a man in Christ. He said it was about 14 years ago who was called to the third heaven. He said, whether it be in the body or in the spirit, I cannot tell. All I can tell you is what happened to me. He said, Fourteen years ago, the Lord had transfigured me in my mind to a place that it's taken me now to tell you about. And he said, I saw things that were unlawful for me to speak to you about. It must have been a wonderful time in the life of St. Paul such rich and bountiful sights that he saw whenever the Lord brought him to the third heaven. While he was there, Paul is teaching us a very fundamental lesson about prayer. And he said, while there, I sought the Lord three times. I besought him thrice that he would remove a thorn from my flesh. God, take this from me. Now that breaks up the myth that says you can't ask God for something more than once. Right. I've heard people tell me and had them to say ignorantly that if you had faith, you'd ask God one time and never ask Him again. The Bible does not bear record of that whatsoever. But the Bible said ask and keep on asking and keep on asking. Maybe it is that God wants to see how desperate you really are and how easily he can shake you from your prayer request. Paul said, Thrice I sought him. Take this thorn from my flesh. And there is a fundamental reason as to why that thorn in the flesh is not named. It's because each and every one of us today have our own thorn 
that we must contend with. Yes. And, if, and if God would have allowed Paul to name whatever it was, it could have been, it could have been a divorce of a spouse that walked out on him when he converted to Christianity from Judaism. It could have been bad eyesight from drinking the putrid waters that made him drink wine. No telling what it was. Maybe it was the fact that there were people dead in their graves because he had murdered them for the gospel that he was now willing to die for. The Bible doesn't name it because I've got mine and you've got yours that you've got to deal with. And he said, God, why don't you take this from me? And one of the very few times passes Acts 1 and eight, where there, there's red letters in the New Testament and Bible, the Lord spoke to him and said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. So whatever you're going through this morning, let this song minister to you. Some days it seems like all that I try is in vain. In spite of my effort, all I produce is more strain. My doubts and illusions, all of my hope soon erase. But His grace is sufficient for every trial that I face.
have imposed upon us Federal Bureau of Investigation, illegally surveilled us through a private citizen's home, cameras that surveilled every one of you that came onto this property, at which point pressure was placed upon employers to terminate church members that were in this building from their jobs. And at that point, people were afraid to come back to church. A lot of different scenarios that we are pursuing in our libel civil suit against the governor, chief of police, sheriff, two mayors, and a judge. And this case is far from over, although we were released on uh, last Wednesday from our charges because of the Supreme Court ruling. Now we're on the offense and the state is on the defense. And this is a tremendous story that if you don't realize the extent of all of the illegal and evil persecution that came against our church, take some time and read about uh, eight or nine pages from the Central City News. This is the newspaper of the year from the Press Association. So this is fair and balanced reporting. Everything in here be honest, and there's no one-sided stories here. There's truth that is written, and it'll really knock your socks off just to see all the extent that the devil would go to to try to close the church down. What, what he realized is, is that he, the more he afflicted us, the more we multiplied and grew. You'll find out. that surveilled our backyard for the past two years, cameras that were on our bedroom window, and the protesters that such a fuss is being made about in Washington, where protesters are protesting Supreme Court justices' homes because of these rulings, you'll find out that those unlawful protesters were promoted by our law enforcement and protected by our law enforcement even given body cameras and had restraining orders placed on me that I could not approach it. So all of this is coming out now, and it's a bad day for the devil and a good day for the church. Amen. And this week we're rejoicing in that after 50 years, Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Thank you for joining us in today's service here at Life Tabernacle in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It means so much to us that you have taken time to worship God with us today in our online service. As you can see, there are many people marching and giving by way of tithing and offering at this time while you are viewing this video. We encourage you to get involved in the tithe and the offering. The Bible says to give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And when you give into the church, into our ministry, I assure you that you are sowing your seed into good ground and it is going to produce a great crop for many people, including yourself. So God richly bless you in Jesus name. We'll see you back in the service in a few moments.
God bless you all this morning as we stand across the sanctuary taking your swords in your hands. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And we came to execute vengeance on hell's chief demon today with this weapon. I know the word of the God is right now. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I know the word of God is right now. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. God bless as we're seated in the fear of the Lord this morning. The parable of the great supper. The word para in the root of the word means to go alongside of. And here, Jesus Christ in his teaching us of a principle is taking his audience from the known to the unknown. The parable would not have been spoken and written by Jesus had it not been 
for the verse's pride. And that was the parable of the ambitious guest. Bible said in 14 and 13, when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. When you want to do something good, do good for those who can do nothing for you in return. Amen. Life's choices, blessings come when you are bidden to go one mile, yet go the second mile. Yes. And Jesus is telling his disciples here, those that you are seeking after to bring into the kingdom of God have very little time for me and they do not realize their need for salvation. They don't think that there's anything wrong with them. They're all right like they are. So Jesus says, you go and you get this class of people, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. There are seven levels of judgment in your Bible. One of those seven, or a seventh part of which, is the judgment of the believer's works. That would be after the first resurrection and prior to the great white throne of judgment. Jesus Christ brings his bride into the banqueting table of that city called heaven. He looks at them and he gives out rewards and blessings and crowns to those who had done great works on the earth. Jesus goes on to tell them, those that you think are going to be first are really going to be last. Those that you thought would be last are going to be at the front of the line. I'm going to, I'm going to recompense them at the resurrection of the just. Everything that you do in life will not be rewarded right away. It may take some time, some months, or maybe even years for that to be recompensed unto you. Nonetheless, in verse number 15, when one of them that sat at meat with Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. We want to know who is going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Who's going to be at the table with you, Jesus? Who's going to be fed by you when you come into your kingdom? Jesus began to teach them of what is referred to as the parable of the Great Supper. And he said, a certain man made a Great Supper. You can tell a lot about where an individual comes from geographically by how they name that evening time meal. Folks have moved in here and come in here from all over the nation and the world in the past couple of years. And it's been some of their desire to take me to dinner. I said, I'm from Baton Rouge and I've never eaten dinner in my life. When it's nighttime, we eat something called supper around here. You can tell what part of the nation they come from by how they call that evening time meal. There's three meals in Baton Rouge. There's breakfast, there's lunch, and then there's supper. People up north eat dinner. But Jesus himself, being the proud southerner that he was, talked about a great supper. He said, this man made a great supper, and he made many. There's nothing that can compare to this supper that was made by this certain individual. I'm not talking about a mid-morning snack that curbs one's appetite. I'm not talking about a simple craving that it can diminish your desire to eat something of greater value. I'm not talking about something just to hold you over until the supper time comes along, but this was a great supper. And this great supper is referencing the church of the living God. 
and the meal that has been prepared in the church and the great salvation that Jesus Christ has given to every one of us today. There's nothing that can compare to the great supper. God's rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. The pearl of great price, the only gem that comes from the sea is the pearl. It is the only one that comes from the pain of a living organism. As a grain of sand gets into that muscle of the, of the oyster, it begins to form uh, a coating upon one on top of another until it makes a beautiful pearl. And Jesus said, the church is the pearl of great price. That's what the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. But when Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary, and that foreign object of the metal spear of the Roman soldier pierced the side of Jesus, that foreign entry Jesus Christ created and birthed one beautiful pearl of great price, the church of the living God. Uh, it is a hell-proof church. For Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That does not mean that, uh, that the church can withstand any attack that the devil brings against it. Because if you have looked around for the past two or so years, hell has prevailed against many congregations. Hell has prevailed in dividing us in our churches. Hell has prevailed in bringing people outside of the church and causing them to lose faith in the church and, and put down on its essentiality while diminishing the greatness of the kingdom of God. Oh yes, the church, it doesn't mean that the devil can't come in here and do what he wants because we know the devil is more faithful than many saints are in the church. For fact of the matter, he's sitting on the back of many of our pews this morning and he's reminding us how unworthy we are to even be sitting on these pews. And every time we try to get our hands up above half mass, he reminds us about what we did or may have said and how undeserving we are of such mercy. But the devil is a liar and the truth is not in him. When the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail, it means that the forces of hell cannot withstand an offensive attack of a Jesus-named, blood-bought, and mercy-taught church that is anointed and unctionized by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, the Bible went on to say in Matthew 16 and 19 that whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God has given the authority and the keys to the kingdom unto every spirit-filled believer in the church today to bind up evil spirits and put them under your feet and send them back to hell where they belong. And God has given you power to unleash the power of the Holy Ghost into your heart, into your home, into your life. And say, I am a part of that hell-proof church. A certain man made a great supper. There's nothing like this supper. There's something special about the taste of it. There's something, there's something appealing and intriguing about it. Every time about Saturday night or Sunday morning, something begins to churn in a Holy Ghost-filled child of God's heart that is church time again. It's time to go into the house of God. And along with David, Psalm 122 and 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into. Let us go into. I'm talking about going into. The church is something you go into. The church is something the devil tries to keep you out of. And David said, I was glad when they said to me let us go into the house of the Lord. If David got excited about going to church, I wonder what David did when he got to church. If David got happy about making a route to the house of God, I wonder what David did when he got to the house of God. He said this place is so great 
He said, this house is so special that I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Just make me a doorkeeper. It doesn't matter if I get on the platform. It doesn't matter if I ever get to testify. It doesn't matter if anybody ever knows my name. But if I can just get into the house of God, that's the greatest place I've ever been. What beautiful what situation is Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Moses said, Moses said, ye have not come into the mountain that might be touched, that furnace with fire, nor unto blackness, nor unto darkness, nor unto tempest. Hey Amen. You have not come into that kind of mountain. That so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. That so much as a beast would touch that mountain, that it was stone or thrust through in the dark. I'm not talking about that kind of mountain today. Moses said fire was over at night and cloud was over in the day and nobody would go up that mountain but one man and Joshua couldn't go but halfway up the trip with Moses and if Moses after 40 days came down his face shined like the sun and his hair was white as snow he was so terrible the complexion was so anointed by God that they had to put a veil over his face that the people could even stand and look at it and Moses said, we haven't even come under that. We've come under something much more special than that. For ye have come unto Mount Zion. There's ten things that we've come unto today. You've come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God. To an innumerable company of angels. One of the reasons that you wave your hand in the air is because you might be shaking hands with an angel right now. You might be, you might be brushing the anointed wings of an angel right now. To an innumerable company of angels, to the city of the living God, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to the blood that speaketh better things than that of Abel, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. I don't know where you thought you was getting dressed to come to today, but I knew I was coming to God's house. This is a beautiful house. This is a transforming house. This is a supernatural house. People get healed of cancer in this house. People get healed of heart disease in this house. God gives you financial blessings in this house. God puts marriages back together in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made a great supper. He made a great supper. And he made men. And you know what? He, he made so many that he sent his servants at supper time. He sent his servant out. Some of us need to realize this morning that we are sent by God. There's a five-fold ministry in the book of Ephesians. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Evangelists give the gospel to the unconverted. Teachers impart information. Pastors shepherdize a flock. Prophets foretell and foretell the future and foretell what God had told them to say. Amen. But the apostles are those who have been sent by God. Amen. That is not a dead office. That is not an endangered office. But when God baptized you in the Holy Ghost and put his name on you in the water, he said, Behold, I give you power to be apostles. I give you power to be witnesses. I give you power to go out. I send you. I sent you out. God didn't call you to let you occupy a pew. God didn't call you to be like a sponge and absorb all this for yourself. God didn't call you to snuff your nose at people that may not look like you or act like you or think like you. But God called you, a man, to be sent by him. He sent his servant out at supper time. John the Baptist was the servant that, that was sent into the wilderness to baptize in the river of Jordan where there was much water. Amen. Elisha was working in the field and Elijah stopped by and put his mantle on him and Elisha took 12 yoke of oxen and took his sword and slaughtered those yoke, burned those yoke and, and anointed and offered those, those oxen 
oxen as a sacrifice unto God. Amen. He sent Elijah to find Elisha. He sent the roof out to work in the field. And she cleaned handfuls on purpose from a man by the name of Boaz. He sent Joseph, who in the winter went out in the field. He said, I'm seeking my brethren. I'm looking for my brethren. Can somebody help me find them? That's why you got to stay in the field, brother and sister. And David left his father's house and went to the valley. And when he left his father's house and went down into the valley, he heard a Goliath that was defying the armies of the living God. The devil might not fight you too bad in here this morning, but when you get out there in the valley, that's where you're going to meet your Goliaths. That's where you're going to meet your oppressors. That's where you're going to meet those demons that want to defy you. But God sent you out of the house to go out there and tell them, you come to me with spirit and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. David put in a stone and he gave it a fling and he sunk that stone in Goliath's head and chopped it off with a sword. Amen. God sent me to tell you that the name of Jesus is the greatest name in all the world. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And God sent you out of this house today to tell a lost and dying world, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is not this the Messiah? Amen. God sent you. God sent you. And you know in Revelation 17 that when Jesus Christ comes back to his church, there's three qualifications for that church. They were called, they were chosen, and they were faithful. Not only did God call you, but God chose you specifically. And when God calls you and chooses you, it's up to you to be faithful. You couldn't, you couldn't get called by yourself, and you couldn't get chosen by yourself. That was God's part. But God can't be faithful for you. God called you, God chose you, and it's up to you to be faithful. For ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you might show forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't know if any of you got the opportunity to look at the, the, the state Republican convention that went on for the past few days. But for the first time in the history of the Republican Party, every candidate and anybody that had enough sense was talking more about this church than any other subject in the Republican convention. Amen. And they were thanking and congratulating and saying that we stand with the winners as well. Amen. I just want you to know that you are somebody today. Not because you were born that way, but because you were born again of the water and of the spirit. And the devil sure doesn't like it when God's church is getting all the attention. The devil sure doesn't
a great supper. I'm talking about a name brand supper. I'm not talking about that Sam's Choice stuff. I'm not talking about that President's Choice stuff. Hey man, when we were young newlyweds, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. But when we were young newlyweds, you don't have a lot of sense and you don't have a lot of money either. So my wife, with a baby at home, would send me grocery shopping. And she'd say, here's what I want. I want non-dish detergent. I want Tide clothes washing detergent. I want this kind of soap. I want this kind of starch. I want this, that, and the other. And everything was name brand. And I got to looking at the name brand price, and I got to look at the President's Choice price. And President's Choice is 30 cents, and the name brand is $3. Anybody know what I'm preaching about right now? And I got to looking at my checking account and how much money I had in the bank. I said, oh, she's foolish. I'm not buying that name brand stuff. When I can get the Piggly Wiggly brand for 30 cents, I get twice as much. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You can get twice as much as the Piggly Wiggly Pink as you can for the dawn and pay a lot less for it. You get it home and she said, yeah, but here's the problem. You got to use five times as much as that stuff as one little bitty drop as the dawn would. And you can't get the grease off the dishes with that with that fake stuff. That's why you gotta spend a little bit more money and get the real thing. Well, when you come to a great supper, you're not getting the off brand. You're not getting the generic brand. You're not getting the off. You're not getting the watered down version. You're not getting the Nutra Sweet version. You're getting the cane sugar. You're getting the real thing. When you came to Jesus Christ, you didn't get a denomination. You didn't get an organization. You got the powerful blood of the Son of God that shed his life for you and for me. It's a great supper. It cost a lot. Amen. It cost a lot of money. This is more precious than silver and gold. It's a great supper. I'm not talking about spam. I'm not talking about Vienna sausage. I'm talking about a ribeye, a T-bone, and a filet mignon. Hey man, it costs you a little bit more to get what is real. And you can get just about anything out there in the world that you want, but it won't fix what's the matter with you. But when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this is not NA or AA. This is not psychiatry or psychology or self-help psychology. But I'm talking about the power of the God that said, let that be in there was. You tried every program that there was and nobody could help you. You tried rehabilitation programs and none of them could help you. You kept relapsing. But when Jesus got a hold of your life and would not let you go, Jeremiah said, it's like fire that shut up in my bones. Jesus said, it's like a well of water that's springing up in the everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I feel all right tonight. What about you? I said, I feel all right in this house today. The greatest victories in the Bible came from men and women who went out with the message of the great supper. And I heard about a soul winning seminar in Chicago, Illinois. And there were all the dignitaries, the theology doctrines, and the, the doctrines of divinity, and all the educated scholars of that time. They had put on a meeting of how to reach the lost and to win the souls and to build a church. And there was a young man sitting out there in the pew when they broke for lunch. That young man went out into the city and he started telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey man, and this man came back after the lunch break, had about 300 people with him, following him behind him into the church. And those dignified leaders of religion said, what are you doing? Dwight, what are you doing bringing all these people in here? He said, well, y'all been talking about it. I just put it into action. He said, don't bring them people in here. We're trying to teach people how to do what you're doing. We don't have time to fool with them today. We're trying to tell people how to do what you're doing. And a man by the name of D.L. Moody in Chicago, Illinois, that's one of the most read and sought after theologians of the 20th century.
country uh, said, well, if you won't have them, I'll just start my own church with them. Uh, and he built one of the greatest churches uh, that America ever has had uh, because he put it into action. Uh, and he said, have you heard about grace? Uh, and somebody said, who is grace? I don't know any grace. Uh, he said, let me tell you about a gracious God uh, that will forgive you, that will love you. He will wash you clean. Uh, if you're dirty, he'll give you a good bath in Jesus' name. If you're in if you're, if you're trouble, he will give you peace with a joy. Go out and make it happen. He's going out. He's talking to people. Because Matthew 13 and 44, the treasure's in the field. The treasure's in the field. The treasure's in the field. A certain man found a great, a great treasure. It was buried in the field. He went home, he mortgaged everything he had, he pawned all his guns, he sold all his toys, and he went down and he put it down on the barrel head, he sold everything that he had, he sold everything that he had, he sold everything that he had, and he brought it to the owner of the field and he said, I'm buying it. And I don't know what you see in this field, that ain't much to it, but if you want it that bad, you can have it. And what he doesn't realize is that there's a treasure in the field, but I got about the whole field and he got the treasure. Some people say they love Jesus, but they hate the saints. Some people say they love the shout, but they don't like the preacher. Some people say they love the preacher, but they don't like the worship. You got to buy the whole field. This is not a salad bar where you just pick and choose what you want. You got to take it all lock, stock, and barrel. The good, the bad, the problems, the happy, the joy, the sorrow. You can't leave anything out, brother and sister. I have bought a field. I have found a treasure. Its worth is beyond measure. Eternal life in Christ I have found. There's such joy and pleasure in my newly found treasure. Since I found it, it's been shouting time. Since I found it, it's been dancing time. Since I found bought a house in Baton Rouge. She left California and went to North Carolina and finally made it to Baton Rouge. She said, I'm moving to Baton Rouge because there's some great supper being cooked down there in White Tabernacle. She finally got here after two years. We've been talking on the phone and texting that. But when there's a great supper, can't nobody keep you away from the table. Can't nobody keep you away from the house. When there's a great supper, nobody can keep you away from the kitchen. Man, good food starts cooking. I start making my way to the They're smoking that meat with hickory. They got pecan wood in there. They're smoking it. You can smell the salt on the ham. You smell it, there's an aroma. Is it any different in the church? I heard about the husband and wife. They were old. And the old man was about to die. He was on his deathbed. They said he's going to die any minute. So the wife started baking cookies for the repast. She was baking cookies in the kitchen, and it just so happened to be his favorite cookies. And the hospice nurse had already left, said he's going to die any time. He started smelling them cookies and got up off that deathbed and started crawling in the kitchen. He reached his hand up on the counter and grabbed the cookie, and she slapped him with a spatula and said, Get your hands off of that. That's for your funeral. You can't do that. But good food will get you up off of your deathbed and get you to the kitchen. There's something cooking in this house today. There's something I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about something natural. I'm talking about miracles. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about supernatural. I'm talking about anointing. Ain't nobody going to slap your hand when you get up close to the kitchen today. That's why there's an altar. That's why there's to get out of. That's why there's aisles to run. That's why there's that's why there's a dance floor up in this front. Because there's a great supper up here. Hallelujah. 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 And the saltier the food is in the kitchen, the thirstier you get. That's why you know put a 
Put a pitcher of tea on the table, because I'm going to get a refill. The food's salty. I need something to drink. The salty. The saltier the sermon and the shouting and the worship, the thirstier I get for Jesus. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're not the sugar of the earth. Some of us are too sweet about God. We let, we let the LGBTQ community march, and we let the, we let, we let the baby killers march and burn down cities because they want to murder babies, and they're upset that babies can live now, and we sit down with our arms folded quiet, Roe v. Wade got no return, and nobody wants, where's the big preachers talking about? Church was your last stop. 
If God didn't help you, you didn't have a promise in tomorrow. If God didn't love you, nobody was going to love you. If God didn't help you, nobody was going to help you. If God didn't fix you, nobody was going to fix you. That's the importance of the church. That's why you know it's essential to me. The church is my everything. job take you to hell. I got this family, man. Everybody ought to have a family. Don't let that family take you to hell. I've got, I've got a house. I've got a car. Man, everybody should have that. Don't let that take you to hell either. More people are going to miss the rapture over the occupation, over the material wealth, and over their spouse and family more than anything else. Because affluence brings decadence. And decadence brings upon America what we have today. The 330 million people represent half of the world's wealth. 7.2 billion people in the United States of America and 330 million of them in America represent half of the world's wealth. Amen. But when they get that occupation and they get that wealth and they get the family, they say, we don't need God. We've got everything God can give us. But I just want to prophesy to you today, brother and sister, that there's coming a time when all of your wealth is going to be taken from you. And your barns that you tore down this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be? When you work a whole day to buy a loaf of bread without anything between the slices of bread, then what are you going to do? But there's coming a time, and do you know why? Because Jonah doesn't go the right direction when he's got money to buy the cruise ship fare. He'll go the wrong direction every time. But God can get your attention, Jonah, and you'll be glad be the messenger for God. And then I'll tell you, America is, has, has on the track to depression and recession. I'm not talking about the church now, because the church is never going to be forsaken. The righteous will never be forsaken. The God will never be found begging bread. But God is going to take care of his church. But there's coming a time on this world like the world has never seen before, and people are going to run to the altar. today faster than you think. I said it's coming on us faster than you can think. Amen. God doesn't need your abilities. God needs your availabilities. Paul said in Philippians 3 and 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. And when you start back there in Philippians 3 and 6, he tells you all that he was as far as apprehension is concerned. He said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, named after the first king of Israel, Saul. I was circumcised on the eighth day, touching the law. I was a Pharisee. I was blameless. I was zealous. I had people thrown into prison because they didn't convert to Judaism. Amen. Paul said, I was really something. Amen. You know that St. Paul wound up saying, now that I've told you all that I am, he said, I counted all but dumb. I counted all nothing to the glory of the cross. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I'd rather suffer with Jesus Christ than enjoy sin's pleasures for a season. You're either suffering with the righteous or you're enjoying sin's pleasures. You're either suffering for the church or you're enjoying sin's pleasures. You say, well, I'm not suffering too bad. Don't you front up in here today. You know the devil's been on your back every day that he can, every way that he can. And the only reason you still got your right mind is because you've been sermonized this morning to get the devil off of your back and get you back on track where you say, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark. I gotta press. I gotta press. I can't, I can't think about the last time I relapsed. I can't think about all the people that's got it in for me. I can't dwell on the people that's talking about me. I can't 
Forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching to those things which are ahead. I press. I press. I press toward the mark. I got to get to the supper. There's resistance to keep me from the supper. Because the devil wants me anemic. The devil wants me to waste away. He doesn't want those nutrients in my body. He doesn't want me to get that water. He wants to get me back on Jack Daniels. He wants to get me back on Colt 45. He wants to get me back on the pipe. He wants to get me back snorting. No, the devil is a liar. There's nothing good at the bottom of that bottle for you. There's nothing but pain at the end of that needle for you. There's nothing but heartache and misery. When you get through it all that, you better come to yourself like the prodigal son and say, I'm going back to the father's house. There's bread to spare. There's mercy there. that was discontent and everybody that was in debt said man I wonder what kind of church he's got just look up in here today full of discontentment full of indebtedness amen full of trouble we are full of trouble in this house today some of you that's got all your act together you come up here and preach the next sermon and tell the rest of us suckers how to get it right because we got real problems here today we might go to jail this week. We might, we, we might, we, we don't know what's going to happen this week. I don't know when God's going to call me home. I've got discontentment. I've got distress. I've got debt. But I know that God brought me to this church on purpose. I know that there's a great supper. He would not have invited me if he didn't want me to eat. He would not have asked me to come if he didn't think I could taste. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I got a job. I got, I got to make money. This ain't going to cost you no money. I got a spouse. I know something about being newlywed. You're so broke you can't pay attention. The best thing to go to is a great supper when you're married. Man, if you're going to take me, take me. If you're going to feed me, feed me. Hey man, I'm telling you that this house, you look at all that God's doing on these 41 acres and 106,000 square feet under roof and 32 air conditioners on the ground and about 57 on the buses. And then you look at 56 toilets, commodes, and urinals. And then you look at the light bills that are going up every month and the garbage collection, and you look at all that and say, how is God doing all that? That preacher, no, 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 let me just tell you, before God can do all of this, God had to bless you. That's why God is blessing you so we can have all this. Don't you know that there is a blessing that is on you today? If this is going to go, then God has to bless you. That's why God wants you to be blessed. That's why God I said compel him. Compel. Yes. That word means to make it happen. Yes. You make it happen. Yes. Don't give me the minute details of building a watch. You just tell me what time it is. You make it happen. You make it, but God, I, I can't make it. You make it happen. If Bartimaeus could cry out when the disciples told him to shush, then you can make it happen. Yes. If the lame man bought a Ford could get an audience with Jesus down through the roof and tore off shingles, then you can make it happen. If a woman with an issue for 12 years could crawl on the ground and touch just the thread of the hem of his garment, then you can make it happen. If Jerry's his daughter absolutely
medicine of life and death is in her body uh, could come and get a miracle that you can make it happen. Uh, amen. Don't you know that the word compel means to make it happen? Uh, that's why each one ought to reach one. Uh, amen. In a year from now, you ought to be a bus driver and you ought to be a bus captain and you ought to be a Sunday school teacher and you ought to be a soul winner and you ought to be a baptizer and you ought to be an altar worker and you ought to be a Bible study teacher uh, because that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to compel them. Compel. And now that you've compelled them and now that you've made it happen, I'm going to tell you, None of them that were bidden of my supper shall taste it. Shall taste it. All of those that you thought really had it together, uh -huh. they're the least likely ones to eat at the table. Uh -huh. But you and me, the main, the hawk, the blind, the sinner, the problem, the heartaches, the depression, the anxiety. You keep saying, why can't I get it together like him or her? We dare not compare ourselves among ourselves. For he that doeth so is unwise. I complained because I had no shoes to wear until I met a man that had no feet. And you would look at me and say, why can't I get it together like pastor? But if you had my problems, you'd probably quit tomorrow. And if I had yours, I'd probably quit yesterday. We don't compare ourselves among ourselves. We compare ourselves to the standard. And that book is the standard. And God says, I've given to each of you a measure. Some 30, some 60, some 90, some 100. The measure of faith. And on judgment day, God's not going to ask you, how did you compare to him or her? He's going to say, what did you do with what I entrusted to you? I gave you five, what'd you do? I made ten. I gave you two, what'd you do? I made four. I gave you one, what'd you do? Man, I was so afraid. I dug a hole and hid it in the earth. You might have nothing left but one today. One dollar, one day, one dream. The devil knows the only way to kill your one dream is to kill you, the one dreamer. So you got to stay alive. Keep hope alive. And let Jesus Christ help you today. This is a great supper. And I'm bidding many to come. There's room at the cross for you. There's plenty of food to eat. It's all you can eat. It's unlimited. It's not going to cost you more. No. He's already paid for it. Is already paid for. He has given us the earnest of our inheritance. That means he's got a down payment on your salvation. All you got to do is come and repent. Be water baptized in the name of Jesus and watch God baptize you. I'll make a deal with you. You get one taste of this. You won't want anything else ever again. When you get full of Jesus, it will feel that longing in your soul. In Jesus' name, as we come out to this altar today, in Jesus' name, you've been looking the same old road. Hey!